You got a problem? You got a problem? No, no, I, I mean, really, do you have a problem? Because if you do, then the scientific method can be what you use to solve that problem. Any problem can be solved through this nice, logical series of steps that you can take. First and foremost, the only requirement you need to use the scientific method, you don't even need to be a scientist, is you need to have a problem to solve. That's right. You need to have some objective in mind, some problem that needs solving. Why? How? What? Anything you want to solve, you can apply the scientific method to. Here's how it's done. Once you got your problem, you can apply knowledge to it. You might have some experience you can draw on, or you can do research. When you do research or draw on experience, try to figure out why your problem is a problem. All you need to do is create what's called a hypothesis. Let's say you bring your car into the repair shop to get checked out. Let's say a car is not starting. Now, the person who's working at the repair shop is going to have some knowledge. Well, what are some things that could cause the car not to start? Maybe the battery is dead. Well, hey, there's a hypothesis. If the battery is dead, then recharging it will cause the car to start. You see how simple it is? Something as easy as that. So the hypothesis is what is applied to solve the problem. Then what you have to do is create an experiment to test your hypothesis, to see if your hypothesis makes sense. So you create an experiment. Now the experiment is going to have a couple of variables. You're going to try to find out what happens in the hypothesis. If I replace the battery with a fresh one, then the device is going to work. So the experiment is very simple. Take out the old battery, put in the new battery, turn it on. The scientific method doesn't actually have to be terribly involved, but it's just a series of common sense steps that you take along the way. That's the experiment. Then, when you do the experiment, you're going to collect observations. Now, these observations can be quite simple. The car starts. That's an observation. If you're testing to see if something is an acid or a base and you're putting litmus paper into it, you could say litmus paper turns blue, litmus paper turns red. Those are observations. Or you might have to take some measurements, collect some data. I'm going to show you how to collect measurements in a later show. Once you have your observation, then you analyze it. Let's say the problem isn't that the battery is dead, but that the battery just doesn't have enough volts to get the car to start. There's a certain range that that battery has to have in order to start. So you check a reference manual. OK, here's the voltage. Here's the range. It's not in the range. That's analysis. Or if you got a whole lot of data and you need to analyze it, the best thing to do is to make a graph. Graphs are an excellent way of organizing data to take a look at relationships between variables. Is it a direct relationship? Is it an indirect relationship? Or is there no relationship at all? That can also tell you that possibly what you're trying to your experiment is having no impact on what your problem is, in which case you'll have to come up with a new hypothesis, but we're getting a little ahead of ourselves here. Once you analyze it, you can do a graph, you can do math, you can look up things on reference tables or reference guides, then you reach a conclusion. Is your hypothesis supported or isn't it? Or is it partially supported? For example, if your graph shows no relationship, then you know that your experiment actually didn't test the problem that the hypothesis wasn't relevant, and so what you got to do now is start the whole procedure over again. Okay, it didn't work. Let's try something new. Let's try a new hypothesis and work it through like that. Sometimes it works. Maybe the battery was dead. Boom, we start. Conclusion, battery was dead, problem is solved. If the problem isn't solved, now we've got to work it through again. Who uses the scientific method? Who doesn't use the scientific method? Doctor's got a patient with an undiagnosed illness. Diagnostics, very, very excellent use of the scientific method, narrowing things down. Plumber has to find the source of a leak. Well, he can't tear your whole house apart, so he has to come up with other methods of testing to find out where the leak is coming from. Electrician has to find the cause of a power failure. So you get into your house, one of your lights isn't working. Where's the problem? Is it with the light or is it the switch box? Where is it? A mechanic has to diagnose a problem with a car. If you're into car repair, the scientific method is going to be huge for you. An engineer has to diagnose the reason a bridge collapsed. Okay, the bridge collapsed. Why did the bridge collapse? 
Why is it important to know why the bridge collapsed? So we know who to sue? Well, okay, we got that. But also, so that when you design a bridge in the future, you don't design an engineering flaw into it. See, if you can understand why a bridge collapsed, you can avoid having that same problem in your future bridge designs. Chemist has to find a better plastic or for a particular application. A lot of times, science is accidental. People are working on something and come up with something completely unexpected. That's called serendipity, when you have a result that's completely unexpected. Okay, great, you've got a result, but now you have to apply the scientific method to it to figure out why did I get that result? So I can replicate it, do it over and over again, make something that other people all around the world can duplicate. Maybe I can get some credit for it and my name on the periodic table. Mm, not a bad deal, huh? That's the scientific method. All it is, is a logical series of steps to solve a problem, and it can be used by just about anyone. It's not limited to scientists.